This is part two of the interview with Jeremy Fike on the Greenland ice sheet in a high CO2 world. And as you point out in the draft of your latest paper, this delay in the response of the ice sheet to changes in climate in your model seems to be more pronounced than in many contemporary models. And you've suggested that this is due to, in your words, the low polar amplification of the model. What is this concept of polar amplification? And what effect does it have on the responsiveness of the ice sheet model to simulated climate change? Well, like I said before, the results coming out of this model are model results. And if you change the model, you get different results. All climate models and ice sheet models and models in general, they attempt to reproduce processes as well as possible. But different models can reproduce those differently depending on how you build the model. The climate model that I use displays what's called low polar amplification. So what polar amplification is, is the ratio in warming between low latitudes and high latitudes. So say you warm up the world by two degrees, an average global warming of two degrees. What is actually observed now to be happening, and, and models have shown this for a while, but it's nice to see observations agreeing with models at this point, is that the poles tend to warm more than the global average. So if the global average warming is two degrees and you have a polar amplification of two times, that means the poles will warm by about four degrees compared to the global average of two. This makes sense because of some important feedbacks in the climate system, in particular uh, albedo feedback. So as you warm uh, the earth, you're going to get a retreat of the snow line, a retreat of sea ice. So you're going to get less sea ice, less snow, less ice because it's warmer. That makes sense. Now, the important thing with ice and snow is that it's very reflective, so it has a high albedo. And what that does is if you have energy coming in from the sun, if you have a high albedo surface like snow or ice, it tends to reflect that energy away and not absorb it and turn it into heat. So if you start to warm the system a little bit and you start to move back snow and ice, you're going to uncover surfaces that are darker, like ocean or like tundra or forest or whatever uh, was being covered by that ice or snow. And that surface almost invariably has a lower albedo than the ice. So it's going to absorb more energy coming in from the sun and warm the system further. And this effect occurs at high latitudes. So you'd expect the relative warming at high latitudes to be greater because of the presence of this albedo feedback. So Polar amplification is, is really just the measure of these types of feedbacks in the system. And what generally occurs is that you get higher warming in the Arctic and Antarctic. In my model, this amplification it exists, but it's lower typically than other climate models. So other climate models get more amplification than the model that I'm using. Um, and that's one reason, really a model dependent reason, uh, to explain some of the results that I've gotten. So do you think it would be fair to say that your results are perhaps conservatively low estimates of potential future change? Yeah, absolutely. Based on you know the other models that have tried to do the same thing, yeah, the results that I get are pretty conservative compared to other models, for sure. It's tough to compare models against models. It would be nice to compare models against the real world, but unfortunately we don't have a real world out there uh, with Cretaceous levels of CO2 to compare against, so we're, we're stuck with comparing models to models. And when you do it that way, then yeah, my model is, is certainly quite conservative compared to other models when it comes to uh, how fast Greenland melts and thresholds on melting. So you're right. Okay, let's take a closer look now at these ice sheet inception scenarios where you're starting with a clean slate, essentially. There's no ice on Greenland at all. And then you set the atmospheric CO2 concentration and see if the model can regrow an ice sheet from scratch. And your experiments show that it would take perhaps 20,000 years or more to regrow the Greenland ice sheet to its full Holocene extent at fixed pre-industrial CO2 levels. Now, interestingly, in these inception scenarios, it's not actually the far north of Greenland where the first permanent ice appears, as you might expect with it being, you know, the closest to the North Pole. Instead, it's the southeastern coast of Greenland that is consistently the seeding ground for these regrowing ice sheets. How do you explain this apparent geographical control on ice sheet inception in your model? So in the model, when I you know get rid of all the ice and then try and regrow ice again, where I get it in the model is typically sort of along the southeast coast. And the reason it grows there is, well, for two reasons. One, there's some altitude there. So there's some mountain ranges. So that's obviously a place where you're going to start getting ice growing initially. Uh, the other reason that 
ice seems to grow there preferentially is that you get a lot of precipitation there. So a lot of the humidity coming off of the Atlantic hits these mountains and rains out. Whereas on the north coast, it's actually very dry. It's a really low precipitation up there. It's almost desert-like. It's sort of like Antarctica in terms of having ice there, but there's not really much precipitation at all. So for those reasons, you tend to get these nucleation sites of ice sort of on the east coast up at high altitudes. So if there's really just this one place in Greenland that is conducive to permanent ice growth, how is it then that we end up with a continental scale ice sheet? Uh, it's an interesting process. And in fact, it's mirrored in Antarctica probably about 30 million years ago. So in the Antarctic case, they've done some, just recently, some really interesting radar surveys of what's called the Gembertsev Mountains. And they've uncovered these just beautifully preserved alpine valleys and cirques that presumably once held little typical mountain glaciers that are now under kilometers of ice. These mountain glaciers really started to grow out onto these lowland plains. And then what happens is because the ice is quite thick, even these mountain glaciers are, say, a half a kilometer thick, just that added elevation of the ice is enough to reduce the surface temperature so that you can get more snow falling and less rain. So it just becomes colder and then more conducive to further snowfall, and then you then you got your, your ice sheet. The other thing, of course, that's important is the fact that as you move the ice out over these lowland plains, just dynamic ice flow out. You're covering up low albedo surface. So you say you're covering up tundra or even bare rock. You're covering that up with ice and snow, which is very reflective. So that's another feedback in the system that acts to cool the whole thing down more and you know, promote more ice growth. So what's being modeled in Greenland in these models is that same kind of effect. So you're getting these little nucleation sites that can pump ice down onto the lowlands. And what they're doing then is raising the elevation there. And they're also making it much wider. So it's much more conducive to continue growing. And then you get your positive feedback where the ice sheet just keeps walking along these lowlands. Now you mentioned earlier the records of ice rafted debris. So glacial drop stones and so forth in the North Atlantic and the implications that those records had for the interpreted long-term history of glaciation in Greenland, which of course remains fairly uncertain. What does your study, and specifically this finding that ice sheets initiate on the southeast coast, what did that contribute to the understanding of the glacial history of the Greenland ice sheet? When you go out into the, you know, the middle of the ocean, say a thousand kilometers away from the nearest coastline, uh, and you go down and look at the sediments, typically they're very fine because with liquid water, you can only transport really small, silty, clay types of material that far before they just finally settle out of the water column. But what they've found out there in, you know, it's sort of 25 million year old sediments is these big chunky pebbles that couldn't have gotten there uh, just by floating, right? They would have fallen out really close to shore. So the only way you can get things like that out is with icebergs. So icebergs calve off and they've been trained these pebbles and, and boulders sometimes within the ice. And then as they melt, say a thousand kilometers offshore, then they drop these things, which settle really quickly to the bottom. Uh, so records of ice rapid debris are a good indicator that somewhere around there, there was ice flowing to sea level and calving off pretty significant icebergs. So in the model, what I see is that at pretty high CO2 levels, you get these ice caps forming on these eastern, sort of southeastern mountains. And even at high CO2 levels, those ice caps are strong enough to pump some ice all the way down to sea level in the model, which indicates that there'd be icebergs coming off that ice and flowing into the ocean. So what's interesting about that is that even if you don't have full continental coverage of ice over all the Greenland, you can still get these sources of ice rapid debris. So People have used these boulders and pebbles and things in the past to say, well, Greenland must have been there. Well, in fact, that might not be totally true because you can get these IRDs or ice rapid debris without, you know, a huge continental ice sheet, in theory. Now, the ideas of system feedbacks and sensitivity are really important when it comes to growing, shrinking, or just sustaining an ice sheet that is forced by climate. And I guess, roughly speaking, you could say that feedbacks are what are responsible for the resulting dimensions of a stabilized sheet based on the initial conditions, whereas system sensitivity dictates how quickly that equilibrium is achieved. Could you explain what hysteresis is in the context of the ice sheet climate system, and also identify some of the key parameters that the system appears to be especially sensitive to? When you have a system that displays 
hysteresis behavior. What that means is for the same set of external conditions, so you know CO2 for example or climate, you can have more than one stable state. So for example, other models have shown that at pre-industrial CO2 levels, you can have a full happy Greenland ice sheet like we see in the present day, but equally you can have a completely happy state where there's no ice at all. And that just occurs because when you have that ice there, it can in a sense sustain itself because it's got elevation and it's got this high albedo, so it can keep itself cool and remain more or less stable. But if you take that ice sheet away, what these other models have said is that, okay, well then now you've got a low elevation, low albedo uh, state and that the ice is not going to regrow there. So in that case, you have two stable steady states for the same external conditions. So that sort of defines the hysteresis. Because the model includes really a, a full ice sheet model, uh, which is complex in and of itself, and then what I've done is coupled that to a climate model, which is, is again, you know, there's thousands of parameters, and if you changed one number, for example, the albedo, if you change the albedo by a little bit of snow or ice, um, then you get a different model result. And the question is, well, how sensitive are your model results to how you've constructed your model? It's an important question that every modeler kind of has to ask themselves because if their model is extremely sensitive to um, very small changes in the model itself, then you start to wonder, well, how, how valid are the results because they seem to be very reliant upon the model itself. So that's one thing that I explored a little bit, We're just looking at some important variables in the model. Albedo was one, and then in the study, lapse rate was another. So how quickly it gets colder as you go up into the atmosphere. Um, those two seem to be quite important over thousand-year time scales when you're looking at ice sheet evolution. So you can change those just by a little bit within the realm of reality, so within the realm of what people have observed, and you can get quite a different response. So that's, it's an important result because it, if you want to use these model results for some sort of policy or some sort of study in the future, then you got to sort of qualify them with, them with the fact that, well, the system is quite sensitive. My final question is a bit of a personal one, and it's essentially asking whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, I guess. But in your personal view, with global trends of carbon emissions and rising temperatures as they are, do you see the application of the findings of your study as potentially helping mitigate the effects of climate change? Or do you think that even at this stage, it's purely going to be a matter of society adapting in response to inevitable change? Sure, that's a great question and one that often comes up in discussions around, at least here in the Victoria Climate Modeling Lab. It's going to be a balance of both. We've already committed ourselves to a lot of global change just from the emissions that we've put out so far, uh, which is something like 300 gigatons of carbon you know, since the Industrial Revolution. And that's the number you want to care about. What worries me is that our societal system is based on profit. And we can now, just with present day oil and gas prices, extract not another 100, 200, 300 gigatons of carbon, but another 5,000 gigatons of carbon. I mean, people talk about peak oil, but essentially there's a lot of coal out there that's very cheap, and it, it would be economical to turn that coal into energy. Um, so what worries me is that our system is really constructed in such a way that it, it will be very easy to continue burning a lot of fossil fuels. And we know that we've done a fair bit of change with 300 gigatons, and if we have 5,000 gigatons to go, then it really worries me what kind of thresholds will be crossed. I mean, Greenland being one, Antarctica being another, but there's there's a whole realm of research out there that's starting to probe what exactly happens when you uh, subject the Earth to a very large and very fast input of carbon. So in that sense, I'm worried. But what makes me not so worried is that humans also have the ability to change very fast uh, what they do. And uh, if, if they can recognize, if we can recognize um, the damages in time, we're, we're now at a stage in our evolution that we're probably smart enough and capable enough to make a change before these projected impacts actually become reality. So in that sense, I'm optimist. For more journeys to the ice, visit cyblogs.co.nz forward slash journeys to the ice. <laughs>